Well, greetings, community of believers, and everyone else checking us out. If this is the first time you are tuning in, my name is Pastor Josh. Welcome. This is not normally the backdrop of our church. We are at the beginning of a VBS week, Vacation Bible School, where we are, we have like 120 kids signed up and 150 volunteers. It's just a ton of people. It is an active week. It's an engaging week, and you can keep us in your prayers if you can remember uh, to pray for God to move and to unite us as a community as we serve these children and as we encourage them to know Jesus. So we happen to be in a sermon series entitled One Another, where we are spending six weeks dwelling on what it means to be together in community as followers of Christ. We're looking at the one another's in Scripture. The phrase one another appears a hundred times in the New Testament. It's derived from one Greek word that means that we are bonded together in a mutual and reciprocal connection, that we're committed to one another. Uh, Of the hundred times in the New Testament, approximately 60 of those are commands teaching us how and how not to relate to one another. Uh, The reality is in this season for us as a church, we're feeling an urgency to be on mission together, building a community that loves Christ, to influence a community for Christ, and we believe this sense of urgency is of the Lord. And so our goal is to prepare well for the fall and to think through some of these scriptures together um, as we prepare on-ramps for people to join in on groups and other discipleship opportunities Uh, We are convinced we need this. We are convinced that this is what we are to be as a church. So the scripture before us today is Colossians 3, 12 to 17. You're welcome to grab a Bible and turn there and kind of put your finger there, hold on to it for a little bit. The title of the message is Admonish One Another. And um, before we dig in, I just need to share a little bit of context with you uh, on what is happening in my life personally, in what is happening in our church, and then some context of the book of Colossians. Context is super important to understand where people are coming from, and so I just want to share a little bit of context with you. So first of all, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about Slovakia briefly. We are just returning from Slovakia. Wednesday this week we returned uh, home after being away for two weeks. Our time was a reminder that God provides, an honor to serve with the same church for the seventh time in the last 11 summers, and it was a joy to watch uh, our team serve. I was able to go with uh, a group of eight of us total, four of us were Reese's, Uh, my wife Wendy and our twins Ellen and Lauren uh, were a part of the team, and then Two 16-year-old young ladies from our church youth group, Eliana and Evany, and then Pastor David, our youth pastor, and Gary Hewitt. The eight of us formed kind of a dream team. It was awesome, and we had a wonderful time connecting with this, again, the same church that we've connected with over and over and over again in Jelena, Slovakia. And uh, it was just a reminder, the whole time was a reminder that God's in control, that he will provide. Thank you for your prayers Your prayers made a huge difference in our travel there and back again. And so a lot of that is kind of what's bouncing around in my heart and my mind still. For me, it was a little bit like uh, Moses and his trip to the mountain to hear from God. On times away like that where we're outside of our bubble and our normal routine, uh, I find that God uses those times to just stir me. And I am stirred and I'm reminded of Our calling as a community and my calling as your pastor. And so I kind of return a little bit psyched and pumped and ready to see what is in store for us next, especially with our our church. So that's the second area of context I want to think with you a little bit about is our church. God has led us to this moment in late July 2022 where our next steps of faith are to plant a church campus in Rhinelander. And we are going to be commissioning our church campus pastor this Sunday. If you are watching it on Sunday, uh, during the worship service on Sunday morning, we are commissioning Justin Olson as the campus pastor. He is shifting from uh, a time of being on staff at Fort Wilderness for the last 13 years to working with us 
at St. Germain Evangelical Free Church as the campus pastor in Rhinelander, and we are excited for him and this community of faith that will be gathering consistently and launching this September. I have seen God provide in very clear ways already as we've been moving forward. I know that he will continue to provide. So as we march toward the fall, and what is next for us in the life of our church, can I ask you to pray? Pray for our community. Pray for discernment. Pray for the community of Rhinelander and people that have not found uh, a life-saving relationship with Jesus. They have not understood what it means to give their whole life to him and to have their eternity secure in him and their present re- present. Uh, reality redeemed by him. I just We want so much for uh, more and more people to know Christ. And I'm convinced that God will provide ongoing direction if we are willing to listen. So pray with us as we move toward that time. Which brings us to the last context that I want to think with you about, which is the Colossian church. It is just so important to know the author and the setting of what we read in Scripture. So we're about to study this brief passage in Colossians 3, 12 to 17. Here's just a little bit of background. The Apostle Paul, along with Timothy, uh, wrote the letter to the Colossians in late 50s or 60s AD while Paul was imprisoned. And as far as we know, Paul had never visited Colossae before he wrote the letter. Uh, A Colossian named Epaphras traveled to Ephesus where Paul was ministering there at the time, responded to God's message through Paul, the gospel message of Jesus, and he returned to share that good news in the small town of Colossae, about 100 miles from Ephesus. And the theme of the letter is Paul writing to this young church, this young church uh, plant, and letting them know that Christ is Lord over all creation, including the invisible realm, that he has redeemed his people, enabling them to participate in his death, his resurrection, and all of his fullness. And so I hope you sense that knowing all of that context before we jump in, is helpful, including the context of, again, what's bouncing around in my heart and mind after returning from being away, what is happening in our church, and what we're about to read in in Colossians 3. So, would you please pray with me, and then we're going to dig in. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and your grace and your, your provision. Thank you for bringing us all the way to Slovakia and back again, our team. Thank you for encouraging the church to pray for us as we go. And and Lord, I pray that as we open your word, you would give us a similar sense of mission with where we're at, with this community of faith, that you've called us to build this community of followers of Christ, to, to grow in love of you, to influence our surrounding community for Christ. So guide us as we think together about this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. This passage has been a theme for me this year. I preached a message on it in December of 2022. I wrote the whole passage down on a note card that I've been carrying with me in my Bible. Uh, I revisited it again with uh, our men's ministry in, uh, in March of this year. I revisited it with the Fort Wilderness Summer Staff at their launch of the summer in June. It was our theme passage as we went to Slovakia It has just been so helpful for me in so many ways, and so I'm excited to open up God's Word and think with you about this. So this is Colossians 3, 12 to 17. Listen as I read. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, 
and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. While our focus is really on verse 16 and the concept of admonishing one another as believers, it is important to know what precedes it. Verse 12 teaches us that we need to daily, intentionally choose to put on godly virtues like we put on clothes. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. There is a choice in how we choose to live, in the way we express what we believe. Clothe yourselves with these virtues. Verse 13 then encourages us to regularly be ready to forgive, to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. Then verse 14 calls us to really love, truly. Truly love, because God's love in Christ is what makes all of this Christian. It's not just generic kindness, it's a Christ-centered kindness. It's not a kind of compassion or patience as just the world defines those things. It's compassion and patience the way Christ showed that to us. So really love, truly, because that's what makes all of this Christian. Verse 15 then urges us as believers to be a peaceful people, a thankful people. And all of that is what precedes the instruction in verse 16 to both teach And admonish one another. And so as I think of this call to teach and admonish, I can't help but think of teachers in particular. Over my years in school, in high school, in college, in graduate school, in seminary, I have had a ton of teachers. And, you know, the most effective ones have showed somehow that they care. That they care about the subject they're teaching, but that they personally care about us teachers that failed just this this is just my experience but teachers that failed to precede their instruction with anything resembling personal care were super difficult for me to learn from what we have here in verse 16 is a command for believers to teach and to admonish each other But what precedes that is a call to care, to be kind and patient and and forgiving and loving and peaceful. To jump to the command to admonish one another as believers without that context is a recipe for disaster. But with that said, let's look closely at verse 16. Uh, It's the longest sentence in this passage, and it sandwiches the call to teach and admonish with the importance of the word and the importance of worship. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. That's the beginning of verse 16. The basis of all our gatherings is the good news. It's it's the message of Christ Before the word evangelical ever meant anything else, it meant the good news. Uh, This church stems from a movement. This church stems from a movement of faith for hundreds of years that always wanted to keep the main thing the main thing. Uh, That there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord over all. That's the message of the gospel. There is peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ who is Lord over all. He's living, he's present, and he's Lord. And those in our movement that have preceded us always asked, where is it written? That was, that's been like a, like a rally cry for uh, the Evangelical Free Church for uh, decades. Where stands it written? We are a people of the word. This is my heart in particular. I am Um, lost apart from the word of the Lord. I am lost on a daily basis apart from spending time in God's word. 
And so this is our heart as a movement. This is my heart as pastor that the word of Christ and the message of Christ would dwell among us richly before we can teach and admonish one another. We all need to be filled with the message of Christ. On our last full day in Europe, we walked around Prague with Mel and Amy Ellenwood. Those are missionaries that we support as a church who once lived in Three Lakes, Wisconsin, and worked at the Three Lakes E-Free Church. And I chatted with Mel about what God had been teaching him in his own quiet times. It's one of my most uh, uh, favorite things to ask other believers is just, what are you doing in your own time with the Lord? What does that look like? What is God teaching you? And in his own quiet times with the Lord, he talked about his own personal need to review the gospel every day. How he needed Jesus how he needed to ground every day in a really, uh, like a realization of all that Jesus had done for him and how when he did that, that led him to interact with other believers better and to view other people who were seeking the Lord with the heart of God. How that had been transforming the way that he did ministry and work and the way that he loved. It was to ground every day in a reminder of, the, uh, of personally the gospel of Jesus. Paul is saying at the beginning of verse 16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. The message of Christ is the culmination of God's story. The Christ is the focus. The message of Christ is the good news That God does not declare us righteous because we ourselves are righteous. And thank God that that's true. Because none of us would ever meet that standard. The message of Christ is that God declares us righteous because by faith we are clothed with Christ's righteous life. God saves us by pure grace, not because of anything we have done, but solely because of what Jesus has done for us. We're free. He's done the work. We can rest in that. That's the message of the gospel. That there is peace with God because Jesus is Lord over all. And that message is to indwell all of us as we gather and as we scatter as a community of faith. I think of so many, at least in the Northwoods, coming from uh, St. Germain and Eagle River and uh, the Minocqua area and Lake Tom and Saner and, and, and Sugar Camp and Rhineland are all of us gathering together and then hearing God's word and scattering back out into our circles of influence. And it's to dwell among us richly. We're not to be stingy about it. Every day, all the time. In John 15, 7, Jesus' words himself were imploring his followers to let his words abide in them. Abide in me as I abide in you. Let my words abide in you. We're to be filled with the good news of Jesus' work for us and his love for us. And our identity is his chosen ones. That's what we're supposed to be all about. All of that should be planted and deeply rooted in our hearts. Within that reality then, we're called to teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. I think we generally know what it is to teach, but listen to the definition of what it means to admonish. To admonish means to express warning, especially in a gentle manner. That's what it means to admonish someone. It means to express warning, especially in a gentle manner. Think of it as constructive criticism. One pastor said, teaching points to positive instruction calculated to build one up in the faith, while admonishing relates to the corrective function of the truth. And these actions are to happen between all of us as believers, not just those that necessarily have the gift of teaching, or for those that are formally teachers. There is a place to teach each other as we just let the word of Christ dwell among us, one another. 
There's a place to admonish one another as well. I believe the picture is most commonly sharing encouragement, frankly, but it will at times mean offering correction. In my life, this happens most often in my close guy friend accountability relationships. Uh, we talk honestly about our doubts and our questions as we share the ups and downs of life together. And at times, the other one sees something that we just can't see. I think of it a little bit like when you're eating dinner with someone else and you may have a, a broccoli dish and you get done eating and there's just this giant green speck of broccoli in between your two front teeth and you have no clue it's there, but the other person gently lets you know you, you, you got like a little something in, in your teeth. Essentially, that's what we're doing when we're walking through life together and we're able to admonish one another as followers of Christ. Most of us want to know about that instead of just being oblivious. Uh, other times, teaching and admonishing is like uh, stepping into conflict, and that can be a different ordeal. Still, there's a way to prepare ahead of time prayerfully when we enter into conflict and, and there's some admonishing there, we should prepare ahead of time prayerfully. We should be willing to affirm the relationship and understand where the other person is and then seek a path forward together and evaluate uh, where God has called us and what is next objectively. Other times, this time, we spend together, even, even remotely, as, as, we, as we open up God's word together, and as we gather in a community of faith, this time that we have together can be a time of teaching and admonishing. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I cannot tell you how many times I've had people after a service come up to me and say, were you following me around this week? Did you have, did you have a, a, a video camera set up in the corner of our house? I'm like, no, that's creepy. I don't do that. Uh, but God's word enters into our souls and it does something. And, and my heart is to seek um, to ground everything I say in God's word. Um, I regularly pray before these times that God would use my words, that my words would be his words. And God's word does something. It gets in, into our soul and it's living and it's active. Every message you are ever going to hear from this platform is always going to be grounded in God's word. And it has a way of doing a work in us. When that happens and we talk about it and we share those stories of growth, I believe that too is a way that we teach and admonish one another. We just can't do this alone. We have to share life together. It has to be with one another. We were not made to go through life alone. And then after that portion of Colossians 3.16, there is this call to let all of this happen through the context of psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. That's like the top piece of bread for this sandwich. The bottom piece of bread is to let the message of Christ dwell among us richly. And then there is the meat, which is to teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And the top piece of bread is to sing to God with gratitude in our hearts. That's the sandwich of verse 16. The message of the gospel and the worship of the saints are vital in the life of our community. Uh, the early church used the Psalms of the Old Testament uh, in singing. They used established hymns of praise in singing. And they use newer composition, uh, compositions inspired by the Holy Spirit. We should too. Singing a range of songs that are straight up scripture, that are traditional 
in, in the hymn books that many of us have known for so many years, as well as spirit-led responses to God's character that are new. I don't know about you, but I find sometimes when I'm singing that it allows me to process. Recently, almost every time I have sang some worship songs, a very specific person, a fellow believer, has come to mind and has kind of been rattling around in my heart and my mind. And, and I don't know what the next steps are, but in, in preparing this message and in giving Giving it even right now, I'm, I'm wondering what God has in store. I'm wondering if there is a place for mutual encouragement, for maybe some teaching and admonishing between the two of us. All I can tell you is that sometimes singing and worshiping the Lord through song uh, allows my heart and my mind to process in a different way. It allows me to worship in a very unique way, especially when we do that together. Songs are a way for us to join our voices together in worship and prayer and community expression. How could we not be drawn at times by the Spirit then to action, to encouragement, to teaching, to admonishing? And so when it comes to that kind of thing, brothers and sisters, to admonishing one another, this is not something most of us want to do very often. In fact, the people that I find that... uh, that crave admonishing. I actually want to admonish myself. I don't see this as the primary call of every believer all the time. It's one aspect of a broader picture, but it's there. And as we live this out, I think others will take notice. Uh, The last verse in this passage then is verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Our overall style of life should be to follow Jesus and to be thankful. We're not perfect, but if we would embrace the sweep of this passage of Scripture, I'm more and more convinced that God will use us to influence this community and to change the world in whatever you do. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I want to close with another touch point from our time in Slovakia as we continue to just reflect on this. This call to teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Uh, The young man that leads the Slovak youth group in Jelina uh, is Adrian. Uh, His Shortened name is Ajo. And the morning before all of the students came to camp, as we were there as a Slovak leadership team and an American leadership team, Ajo spoke to us and gave us a devotional. And he shared a quote that I had never heard but will never forget. Imagine a world where people skeptical of what we believe are envious of how well we treat each other and amazed at how well we treat them. Let me say that again. Imagine a world where people skeptical of what we believe are envious of how well we treat each other and amazed at how well we treat them. That framed the way we as a leadership team and believers in Christ welcomed the students, some of them that were seeking, that did not believe in the Lord, some of them that come from a background where they're just distant from a personal relationship with God. It framed how we went through the entire week um, as we were away. So can I encourage you to pray more often for others in your life? And then daily, intentionally, choose to put on godly virtues like we put on clothes. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Regularly be ready to forgive. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Really love and pursue peace. Be a peaceful people and a thankful people. And when that is the air we breathe, when that's the water in which we swim, then may we be willing to teach and admonish as the Lord leads, following that with a heart of worship together. 
I love this. This is what I love to do. And I love to be a people as followers of Christ that are growing in these ways, clothing ourselves with these virtues, being willing to do some of the hard things together and to grow as a community. Not a perfect group of people, but growing as a community of followers of Christ. Any group of people can hang together when things are going well. It's how we treat one another when there is a need for correction, reconciliation, and growth. May we truly live for Christ in the way we treat one another. Heavenly Father, my prayer today as we look at this passage is that you would stir us and bring to mind ways that we can be faithful and obedient to this call. In all of the ways that we put on virtues, but also in the way that we teach and admonish one another. So Lord, as this comes to the surface for us today, may May this also arise in us, awake in us, a need to be faithful to you in in all of these ways. And would you bring people to mind? Would you help us be faithful in our response and uh, prepare uh, prayerfully and, and humbly, but then to obey you? Lord, thank you for the season that we find ourselves in. Thank you for VBS. I pray this week that uh, that the, the helpers and the students uh, would just be open to your presence, would be uh, uh, experiencing the joy of the Lord being their strength, would just love being in this place, knowing you more. Thank you for this time. I pray that you would guide us moving forward. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this week.